In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most well-known country songs of all time is John Denver's Country Roads. Its folksy tune, rhythmic banjo, John Denver's distinctive tenor-ish voice, and a deep sense of nostalgia takes the listener on a journey through the country roads of West Virginia, through the Blue Ridge Mountains, past the Shenandoah River, to almost heaven, almost home. Roads have a way of doing that, don't they? They take us back to those places of comfort, those places that feel like almost heaven, almost home. Except when they don't. Like those roads that take us to places where we don't want to be. Like a rocky marriage or an overwhelming work or life circumstance or a hopeless diagnosis or heartbreak. What's God up to, we may ask. These past four weeks, we have been journeying through a sermon series on the life of Jacob called The Bumpy Road of Obedience. And we have learned that Jacob's long and winding and bumpy road, sometimes both literally and metaphorically, was not always a road that he expected to be on. And today in this final installment in our sermon series, Jacob's bumpy road, it goes from being transformed by God to flourishing. From being transformed by God to flourishing. But what exactly do we mean by flourishing? For example, why do so many people in our culture today put celebrities and CEOs and social media influencers up on a pedestal as examples of success and happiness and the American dream? Even though many of these individuals are socially dysfunctional, self-absorbed, morally bankrupt. Are these individuals examples of godly flourishing? Why do so many people in our culture today allow our young and impressionable children and grandchildren to be influenced and corrupted by exploitative ideologies promising a good life? When it is in fact God alone who gives us eternal and abundant life. What does God mean by human flourishing? This morning, I submit to you that God defines human flourishing this way. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to everyone around us. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to everyone around us. We are blessed to be a blessing. This is what God means by human flourishing. And today what we're going to do is we're going to learn from Jacob's life. In, in this last sermon of the sermon series, we are going to learn from Jacob's life about God's definition of human flourishing. After wandering on bumpy desert roads for many decades, Jacob, now old, has finally settled in the promised land. He is wealthy. He has many wives. And he has about a dozen children. But yet he's nowhere close to God's promises of children that outnumber the stars in the sky. Now, one of these children is Joseph, a 17-year-old tattletale, seemingly with delusions of grandeur. And yet, 
Jacob, he lavishes gifts upon Joseph like a very expensive robe, much to the envy of his older brothers. And so as it turns out, beyond the chapters of what we just read and heard this morning, Joseph's wicked brothers, they kidnap their annoying little brother. They sell him off to slavers. And then they lie to their father, Jacob, that Joseph was killed by beasts. And as the story goes, Joseph has his own bumpy road of obedience. He's sold as a slave to an Egyptian master named Potiphar. And he rises through the ranks because, as it turns out, Joseph has inherited his father Jacob's shrewd business acumen. But then Joseph is wrongfully thrown in prison on false accusations of sexual assault by his master's seductress wife. Poor old Joseph, sitting and rotting in an Egyptian dungeon. But somehow, after many years, by the grace of God and through a series of fortunate events, Joseph gains employment in Pharaoh's household. He creates a business proposal for Pharaoh that helps Pharaoh slowly amass the best and fertile real estate in all of Egypt. And then he also prevents Egypt from collapsing in a global famine. So we see Joseph rising from rotting in an Egyptian dungeon to becoming Pharaoh's right-hand But what of his father, Jacob? You see, this global famine eventually reaches the doorsteps of Jacob's house. And it threatens to destroy all that God has blessed Jacob with. And so Jacob's sons, remember, they are Joseph's wicked brothers. They visit Egypt, hat in hand, begging for a few morsels of bread. So that... They and their children don't starve to death. Joseph and his brothers, they reconcile, and Jacob's whole family, wives, sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, a clan of 66 Israelites, they all relocate to one of the most fertile areas of Egypt. And there, in this fertile region of Goshen, in Egypt, over several hundred years, Jacob's family finally flourishes. And God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their offspring will outnumber the stars in the sky is much closer to fruition. You see, Jacob had his journey of obedience. And it was only through this journey that God blessed him abundantly so that he could be a blessing to his family and to generations of Israelites yet untold. Similarly, Joseph, Jacob's son, he also had his own journey of obedience. It was filled with his own stories of betrayal, misery, perseverance, and patience, where eventually, God blessed Joseph abundantly. God blessed Joseph abundantly so that Joseph too could be a blessing to his wicked brothers and their children. And the road of obedience doesn't end there, does it? No, it continues on. It continues with the Israelites, which is Jacob's clan. It continues with the Israelites becoming the people of God. And it is through the Israelites, God becomes incarnate as Christ Jesus to save the whole world, to save all of us, not just from death by famine. Rather, he saves us from eternal death because of our sins. You and I, we are all Abraham's, Isaac's, and Jacob's spiritual offspring. 
spiritual children that outnumber the stars in the sky. And this is the greatest blessing that you and I could ever have. To be saved by God through the Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ, our Lord, even though we are not genealogical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God blessed Jacob. God blessed Joseph. God blessed Israel to be a blessing to the whole world. And likewise, God blesses us too so that we too can be a blessing to everyone around us. This is human flourishing. This is what it means to flourish as humans, where you and I, we are blessed with the greatest blessing of all, which is eternal life. And so that we can bless others with this message of eternal life as well. And this is where you and I, we need to part ways with our culture. This is where you and I, we need to disagree with our culture. We need to have the boldness to say to our culture, you've gotten it wrong. You don't know what blessing truly is. You see, our culture tends to believe that blessing is purely, it's exclusively, it's 100% material. Blessing is exclusively purely things like financial success, healthy and beautiful Instagram-worthy lives, the fulfillment of every unchecked desire. But if that's the case, then Jesus would have been the most famous and financially unsuccessful man who ever lived, who died the most embarrassing and shameful death that was ever possible. But yet, we stand up here every morning and we say that Jesus is God. We proclaim in the words of the Nicene Creed that Jesus is God. So what do we make of a God whose idea of flourishing and blessing was being a nomadic preacher with little to no money? Who was betrayed by a close friend? who was tortured and crucified naked upon a cross and buried in a tomb that wasn't even his? What do we make of a God who chooses a stable to be born in over a palace? Who chooses a donkey to ride on over a warrior's chariot? Who chooses the hard wooden cross over a plush golden throne? who chooses the bumpy road of suffering and death, even the road to Golgotha and Calvary, for the sake of friendship and love with unworthy sinners like you and me. You see, the same God, Christ Jesus, who chooses loving and dying for unworthy sinners, even over his very own life, this God blesses us with the greatest blessing of all. More than wealth, more than health, more than fulfillment, this God, Christ Jesus, he blesses us with himself. He blesses us with himself. So as you journey on your own roads of obedience, perhaps finding yourselves in places where you wish you weren't, perhaps even feeling like Jacob's sons and Joseph's brothers, like you are on the brink of your own spiritual famine, feeling like you have to enter into the Lord's presence, hat in hand, desiring a morsel of blessing. Remember that the Lord desires deeply to bless you. Remember that the Lord has already blessed you. He has already blessed you with a blessing more worthy than any worldly blessing. And that blessing is himself. This is how you will flourish. 
This is how you'll flourish regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of that rocky marriage, regardless of that loved one who has lost, uh, regardless of the diagnosis that you have no hope against, regardless of that heartbreak. This is how you'll flourish. By clinging, by holding fast, by placing all your trust in Jesus, who has given you himself, his whole self. So this morning, I invite you to come to the Lord's table. Come all of you who are hungry, who are needy. Come all of you who are poor. Come all of you who are starving sinners. Come, come to this, the Lord's table. Come expecting more than a worldly blessing. Come ready to receive the greatest heavenly blessing of all, which is Christ's eternal presence with us. Come with open palms to receive the sacrament of his body and his blood given to us in morsels and sips of bread and wine. Come and receive him who has given you himself. And as you go out into this world, rejoicing and wiping away the crumbs from your lips. Invite all those other people, all those other poor and needy, hungry and starving sinners that you find in your life. Invite them to this, the Lord's wonderful banquet and feast so that they too can experience flourishing, so that they too can experience blessing. So that they too can cling fast and hold fast to Jesus Christ, who has given them himself. Let me pray for us. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you did not withhold anything from us, nothing you have withhold from us, but you have given us all things, O Lord, even your Son our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, to place our hands upon him, to cling to him, to hold fast to him, who is our greatest blessing. And teach us, O oh God, to confidently tell the world that the things that they have held on to, which is not of Jesus Christ, cannot help them. But only Jesus Christ can help us. We ask this in his name alone. Amen.